Hey everyone, Danny Jones, Singing News Magazine. You are watching Danny's Diary, the podcast powered by Singing News Magazine. My guest today, as you can see, is someone that I call a legend, and that is Mark Trammell of the Mark Trammell Quartet. Mark, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Danny? Oh, you know what? I can't complain. There are many more options that could be worse than speaking with you today. Well, <laughs> well I'd be low on the list. Go ahead. I'm, I'm... <laughs> anyway, I, I like throwing Mark little lines like that because there's no telling what he's going to come back with. He and I have the same warped and twisted sense of humor. So my this... wife calls it demented. I don't know what that means, but it's probably not good. Well, unfortunately, your wife is very smart, and she may have pegged it very well right there for both of us, actually. So, uh, Mark Trammell, this is year number 46 for you in singing Southern gospel music. There are very few people on the road today who can say their career has spanned almost five decades, but you're one of them. And uh, one thing I can say is that you are enjoying this year even despite its challenges, even more so than you have in the past because the Mark Trammell Quartet is really turning into exactly what you wanted it to be. We are, uh, we have enjoyed a, a lot of success um, and I measure success differently than a lot of people do, as you already well know. Uh, but we've enjoyed uh, uh, a lot of the fruits of the labor over the last few years, but especially uh, starting in January of this year, things just began to gel, come to fruition. Uh, much like the dream that I had 18 years ago when we started, although I didn't know we were going to be a quartet at the beginning, uh, but I couldn't separate myself from my first love uh, forever. So of course that took place back in 2010. Uh, but we are, we're having a great time and the guys are eager to get back to work. We've already, we've, we've done two dates since March 14th and uh, boy, it just made us, made us want to go back to work now. Uh, we will do that in the next few days. You know, everybody's looking at the calendars thinking, okay, well, maybe we can get going by this date or this date. Yeah. One good thing, as I've mentioned with some other guests on here, is that when everything opens back up again, the schedules are just going to be jam-packed because fortunately, while people are postponing dates, they're not really canceling dates. They're just shoving them on farther back, and we'll get it in as quickly as we can. So when this thing opens it's going to be Katie bar the door. We're, we're very blessed in, in, uh, the cancellation versus postponement, uh, as well. And just thrilled, uh, that people, uh, have moved things forward. It's like our entire life. Uh, everything in the world is, uh, a preacher friend of mine said, God's hit a great big reset button and everything has become new and different and we just got to get accustomed to what's going on. And, uh, he's not quit being God. Uh, he still has us here. If we're breathing, there's an obvious reason for it. We've got something to do. And our reason for being here, of course, is, uh, to sing this music and tell people uh, about the Lord and what he can do in our lives and encourage them to keep on going. That's what we're going to do. Exactly. So on a personal level, yeah. what has been the biggest challenge for Mark Trammell during all of this? I am an active person. To tell me I've got to stay in my house, which I love. Uh, I've been, uh, in fact, uh, just yesterday, another, uh, of our industry friends who has been out here many years asked me the question, uh, are you getting cabin fever yet? And I told him I had gotten that back in April and, uh, he just, he laughed out loud. He said, well, have you ever been off this long? I said, no, 46 years, uh, this coming August. And, uh, I've never been off more than three weeks for any reason. And that's usually at Christmas time. Um, 
it, does that mean I just don't like being at home? No, not at all. We're usually at home, uh, as you know, three to four days a week, according to, you know, what season of the year it is. Uh, but we travel three to four days a week and that's been my life. And to tell me that I can't do that. Oh my goodness. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I can handle that. Um, I just thank God that he's given me the health to keep doing it. And maybe if that day comes when my health is not good enough to continue to do this, the way I've done it at the level that I've done it, um, maybe God will ease that uh, burden, that desire that's in me uh, to get out there and continue telling people this message. I don't know. But what I do know right now is I feel good. Uh, all the guys in my group are healthy and happy and their families are healthy. And God has provided for us in such a way that we've made it through all of these days. And uh, again, I've had a lot of friends, a lot of great encouragement. Uh, and another pastor friend just called to check on me the other day. He said, uh, you realize that you continue to be faithful in what God's called you to, and he will see you through even things like this. And he has. Yeah. So Danny, uh, I have no complaints. God's been good. I've eaten more ice cream in the last four months than I ever have in my life. Okay. And my suits tell it. Okay. Well, we got to ask the question. What's your favorite flavor? My favorite flavor. Whoo. I've got three or four. I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, black walnut. Um, I really do like, uh, pistachio ice cream. But pralines and cream is probably going to be at the top mm. for me. So it's not your typical chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry for Mark Trump. No. And if you go to cookout, there's only one milkshake that they make, and that is banana. The All the rest is imitation. Okay. It's okay. banana if you go to cookout. And there is the official spokesman of cookout this week. All right. Well, since you brought up ice cream, uh, um, I was talking with one of our mutual friends the other day and he mentioned, he said, of all the things I've missed about the traveling of gospel music is going to a certain town and eating at a restaurant that I only get to eat at maybe once or twice a year. Okay. And uh, he, he, he named several towns and several restaurants. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw that question to you of all the different places you've had the opportunity to eat at that you, that you still, maybe visit once or twice a year. What is the one place you're just looking forward to uh, going back into? Uh, it's in Texas. And it's called La Hacienda. And it's not too far away from the Daystar Television Network Studios in Bedford, Texas. La Hacienda. It's some of the best fajitas you will ever eat in your life. I'm just telling you. Okay. So, so when they see Mark Trammell coming the next time, they know he's coming on serious business. Oh yeah. Just stay out of my way. You allow to get bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's walk through the history of Mark Trammell a little bit. Um, most folks who follow gospel music are familiar with your uh, career path. Um, uh, and, uh, but there, with every, with every group that you've been a part of, there's always a, a certain story that uh, uh, a lot of folks don't know. For example, let's let, let's uh, let's pick up to the let's start at the time when you joined the Kingsmen. Okay. Uh, you were part of that group for a while, and a lot of people, for some reason, tend to overlook that time. Uh, when you were at the Kingsman, a lot of them think uh, you started with the cathedrals. Well, there's a little bit of history prior to that. Mm -hmm. But you told me one time a great story about when your time at the Kingsman was coming to an end and you were making the move and uh, how two wonderful leaders and friends that have gone on, uh, Eldridge Fox and Glenn Payne, how they made that transition so easy for you. And I, th I think that's a really neat little story that you could share. The, uh, the interesting part about that, as I look back on that in my life, 
um, I've been able to learn a lot of things from that outside of just what took place with me. Uh, learn how to treat people. Um, um, learn the best avenues uh, to go down when it comes to change in groups. A lot of things I learned uh, looking back on that. I did not know um, as a 21 year old young man that if you decide to do something else in your life and you let someone remotely have the idea that you might want to improve or better your life or your position or uh, move forward with what you love. I didn't know that you could be fired from the job you had because they don't want you anymore. If you don't want to be there, none of that was in my mind, none of it. And I, I say that just to set up what took place when I, first of all, you already know history tells that I loved Glenn and George. I loved them before I went there. I was one of the biggest fans they had before I went to them as a teenage boy, uh, as a, an adolescent when they were at the Cathedral of Tomorrow uh, on the television broadcast and it came to KARK TV Channel 4 in Little Rock when I was a kid growing up and we'd watch it every Sunday morning before we would go to church. In fact, uh, Jubilee would be on and then right after Jubilee, the Cathedral of Tomorrow would come on and we would usually get to hear most of the music before we would leave to go to church. Uh, hardly ever got to hear Rex preach, uh, but we would hear most of the music. So I fell in love with the cathedrals and uh, I, I felt like I knew them. I didn't, but I felt like I did. And uh, after uh, my tenure with the Kingsman, uh, at the end of it, I, I decided one day, I'd told, I had, in fact, I had told my wife, I'm going to go tell Foxy that I want to go try out for the Kingsman. We had gotten home. I had heard about it over the weekend that uh, there was going to be an opening there and that Steve Lee was leaving to go back home. And the road just wasn't for him. He had been there for six months. He didn't want to do this. I was going to go and talk to Foxy about it. So I went to the office on a Monday and uh, I just kind of hung around the office most of the morning and it got close to lunchtime. <laughs> And uh, Foxy uh, saw me just easing by the door a time or two. And I was talking to Jerry, the secretary, and just doing some things for her. Uh, took some mail to the post office, just hanging out. Um, and, of course, very obviously, that was not commonplace for we guys to hang out at the office on Monday. We were usually at home uh, washing clothes and getting ready to go back out, things like that. And Foxy, about lunchtime, Foxy finally said, Marky, come in here and sit down a minute, son. So I went in there and sat down. He said, okay, tell me what's wrong. I said, what? What are you talking about? He said, no, something's wrong. You've been hanging around my door all morning long. I've been on the phone. I've watched you. I'm caught up. So I want to know what's going on. And then I'm, we're going to go to lunch. I said, okay, that's fine. Uh, and I began to cry, 21 years old, and I began to cry. I said, Foxy, uh, it, I've realized this may hurt your feelings, and I don't want to do that. But I have an opportunity to try out for the cathedrals, and I'd like to do that. But at that point, I was playing bass and uh, singing a little bit with the Kingsman. In fact, I was singing more by that time because... Uh, Squire had left. Foxy had had that, that uh, Bell's palsy issue. And so he was at home, sidelined. He was at home. So uh, I was doing a lot of singing. And uh, Beaver was having to play bass instead of the steel uh, for a few weeks. But as I began to share with him what was going on, he asked me, he said, does Glenn know about this? I said, no, sir, I haven't, I haven't talked to him about it yet. I'm planning to do that tonight. And uh, that particular night was uh, the, er one of the early beginnings of the Singing in the Smokies for that year. So on that Monday night of Singing in the Smokies, 
I drive out there after talking to Foxy. Well, what Foxy told me before I left the office was this. I've never had a man come to me and just tell me, I want to try to do this. And he said, in all my years of managing, I've never had that happen. He said, so here's what's going to happen. You go talk to Glenn. If he'll let you try out, I'm going to pay for your plane ticket to go to Akron, Ohio and try out for the cathedrals. Um, if you get up there and they like you, they hire you, you have my blessing. If that you get up there and something's not right, or they decide you're just not a good fit, whatever the case, you come back home, you get back on the bus, you don't say a word to anybody and we'll go right on just like this never happened. Are you okay with that? I said, yes, sir. I'm fine with that. And sure enough, uh, I, that night I went and I talked to Glenn. Well, I actually I talked to George first and I told him what was going on and that I had gotten Foxy's blessing. He said, really? I said, yeah. He said, okay, then you need to talk to the old man. So I went out to the record rack and uh, stood behind that record rack at Inspiration Park. And I talked to Glenn about the possibility of coming to try out. He said, when can you get there? I said, I don't know for sure, but I'll find out. Uh, when are you going to be at home? He told me. So uh, the following week on Monday evening, I flew to Akron, Ohio. And uh, Tuesday, uh, I tried out Tuesday morning. And Tuesday afternoon, I flew back. And before I left to come back, uh, Glenn told me, we've heard all we need to hear. If you want the job, it's yours. And I did not realize all that had taken place. But when I left the office in Asheville, Foxy called Glenn. And he told Glenn, uh, he found him out at the Holiday Inn in Silva. And he told him, uh, Mark's coming to see you tonight. You don't need to tell him that we've talked, but he has my blessing. And uh, I think he wants to be there. He loves you all. And I think he loves you all as much as he does us, uh, but he wants to be there and, and it'd be a good place for him if you can use him. I didn't know all of that until long after uh, the rest of this happened, but two great men, and uh, they knew how to handle those things. And I was just a kid knowing that I loved what I did. And the only downside is I had to move to that snow. <laughs> I lived in Stowe, Ohio for 11 years. And uh, I will tell you that it was easy to overlook the cold weather because I got to travel with two of my heroes. Yeah, and you know, uh, that story is just, is, is, you and I know this because we were around them a lot those guys and, and several others, Les Beasley and a few others, the things they did quietly behind the scenes to help young people walk through doors. Absolutely. We'll never know the full extent of that until we get to heaven. But all of those guys that we all grew up watching and, and, you know, they were our heroes, if you will. Yeah. Uh, they did more stuff behind the scenes than we'll, oh, ever, yeah. we'll ever imagine. It's, it's yeah. just, incredible. We, we've all got stories we could share all day long from the cathedrals. You, you spent some great times there. I mean, the, uh, some of the most landmark recordings and gospel music were made during your time uh, with the cathedrals. But of all the things that happened at, uh, during your time with the cathedrals, nothing tops, what took place in Dell city, Oklahoma, one year on a golf course, July 13th, 1988. Right. And uh, for those who may not be familiar with that story, this is the ultimate Mark Trammell story right here. I had uh, been dealing with an issue. Uh, I, I found myself just miserable. If you want to know the truth about it and everybody around me was getting that way. What I didn't know is I, I thought maybe, okay, am I, am I sick? Is there something going on? I didn't want to be, I just wanted to play my guitar, sing my songs, go to the bus. I did. I got, and then I got, I got to thinking about it and I realized, okay, 
back in the spring, we were at a Starlight Crusade in Spartanburg, South Carolina with Bailey Smith. And I had heard a message um, after that night was over with a friend of mine, Jim Murray, who sang for the Imperials for many years, another legend in our industry. Uh, he and I were talking about it because they had been there as well that night. And he and I were talking about that message and what a great message it was. He said, if you like tonight's message, which uh, the title of that message was, Will God Burn Your Barley Fields? And powerful message uh, by Bailey Smith. He said, if you like that one, if you enjoyed that, if it intrigued you, you need to listen to one called Wheat or Tares. Have you ever heard it? I said, no. He said, come with me. So we walked from our record tables over to uh, see Dr. Smith and he got a cassette and he handed it to me. He said, you listen to this when you can, it will literally light you up. Great message. What he didn't know is it was going to light me up. All right. But I found myself, uh, under conviction. I realized what was going on with me is I was lost. I knew all about the Lord. I grew up in a Baptist preacher's home. I had walked the aisle. I had shook the preacher's hand. I'd filled out the card. I had prayed words with my lips that I didn't mean one word of with my heart. All of that stuff took place from April to July. All of that was working on me. And uh, I realized it at the Starlight Crusade, uh, July 13th, 1988. I got up that morning. And I couldn't sleep. I knew we were supposed to play golf, uh, a little golf outing of about 16 men from church. So that morning I got up about five o'clock and Fred Privet, our driver and myself were sharing a room. And I just really quietly got out of my bed, got on my knees and I asked the Lord, Lord, you may or may not answer this prayer, but if you're telling me that I'm lost, would you please let me play golf with that preacher today? preacher was Tom Elif and uh, who was the pastor of the church uh, by this time. And I got up, I cleaned up, uh, got ready to go. Fred uh, and I went to breakfast and we got to the golf course and I'm literally standing outside a little bit apprehensive, a little nervous because of this golf outing that's going to take place. And uh, the guy that uh, from the pro shop walks out on the, uh, the porch there at uh, Willow Creek and starts telling everybody what groups they're going to be in. And uh, Tom Elif was the last guy there. He was walking up the sidewalk from the parking lot toward uh, the clubhouse. And <laughs> That guy turned and looked, he said, uh, Brother Tom, I'm glad you're here. Mark Trammell's right behind me. The two of you are going to be in the first group. And Jim Lee and Joe Cox are already over there. And they were uh, two men from the church. Uh, in fact, Jim Lee, I believe, was a deacon in the church. Um, boy, I'm talking about, it's like the lights went off for me. God just put me in the same, not in the same foursome, but he put me in the same cart with this preacher. Well, what does that mean? So man, I, I, Danny, I couldn't tell you for my life what took place. Uh, the first two holes, I could have made a hole in one and I don't remember it. I, I know I didn't because nobody told me I did, but, uh, I really don't remember playing golf the first two holes. Uh, the third tee box, I got out of the cart and I was shaking. And uh, Brother, Tom, Brother Tom said, uh, Mark, son, you okay? Uh, it's hot out here. Well, it is, it's, you know, middle of July, Oklahoma City. And it was already 89 degrees and high humidity by that time. And uh, he said, you, you hadn't got too hot? I said, no, sir. I said, Brother Tom, I'm lost. And I've asked God to prove to me that that's what's going on with me, confirmed to me, and he has. And uh, 
you know all about me, but what you don't know is I'm lost. I need to know the Lord. I know about him, but I don't know him. And he just, tears come up in his eyes and he smiled real big. He said, I can't think of a better place for us to fix that than right here. So the, the third tee box, there's a, there's a bench that's still there last time I was out there. And uh, we knelt at that bench at the third tee box of the Willow Creek golf course. And uh, he led me in the sinner's prayer down the Romans road. Same thing I had done with lots of other people before. Um, but this time, uh, boy, it was so different. And uh, I remember when I got up, Danny, I, it being that hot, we were wearing, we were all wearing shorts to play golf in. And I remember when I got up, they had been sprinkling uh, uh, water in the grass the morning, that morning before we got there. So it was still kind of a muddy spot right there at that, that bench. Well, I was on my knees when I got up, I was dirty. I had some of that old red clay on my knees. And I just looked at Brother Tom, I said, boy, that's, that's odd. He said, what? I said, the, the feeling of being dirty on the outside, but the first time in my life I'm clean on the inside. <laughs> And uh, Glenn and Danny were in the foursome right behind us. And here they come. They thought, they thought I was sick. They didn't know what was going on. They come running over there. After they finished uh, uh, hole number two. And they come running over to see what was going on. And uh, I'm just standing there squalling with my hands in the air, laughing and squalling at the same time. And uh, Glenn asked, Tom said, is he okay? Before he got to me, he said, is he okay? He said, yeah, I think he's probably better than he's ever been before. Brother Glenn said, well, what happened? He said, he just got saved. And Glenn just hollered. He looked at me and smiled real big. He said, of all the boys that's ever worked with me, I'd have never thought you was lost. I said, well, I didn't think I was either, but God showed me that I was, but it's took care of him now. And man, I'm going to tell you, that night when we got to the church uh, for the Starlight Crusade, when we walked in the doors that evening, we changed, put our suits on, walked in the doors that evening. Um, for the first time with saved ears, I heard the choir sing, and they were singing, uh, So I'll Cherish the Old Rugged Cross. And man, I'm telling you, I can still hear him singing it right now. I can, I can, I can still tell you the scene. I can tell you everything about that building. I can tell you the uh, the choir robes that they had on. Uh, I can tell you every detail because it's like boom for the very first time. I got to hear with spiritual ears what I'd been paying attention to. I love music. I love tasteful music. I love harmony. But man, all of a sudden, the Spirit of God rises up in me, wakes up in me when I get to hear that from the spirit man perspective. And it's just different when you know him instead of just know about him. Yeah. It is. And, uh, of course, that day, you know, is going to always be one of the most cherished memories uh, that you'll ever carry. Oh. With you. and, yeah, absolutely. You know, and as you were telling that, you know, I, I can't help but go back and think, you know, that day may have been a different day had not Foxy and Glenn talked you know, several years before. Who, who knows what could have happened? You know, in hindsight, we can say God knew exactly what he was doing. Well, yes, <laughs> he always does. Exactly. But there's so many details in our lives that we don't have a clue that's going on until sometimes we never know them. Right. Uh, it's been proven to me, but, but very often I think God allows us to find out some of those things later in life, just to show us where he was using somebody else to protect us or guide us. Uh, every day it happens. When your time at the cathedrals came to a close, uh, yeah. you made a phone call. Yeah that uh, I don't think he saw coming at all. Uh, if, if, I, if, if my facts are correct, basically the conversation went like this. Gerald, 
I'm going to start a group with you. And that, that was the gist of that phone conversation, I believe. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I said to him. I called him, told him, I said, you're, you sitting down and, uh, Again, to set that story up, you need to know that Gerald and I, when he came there, he and I developed a, a brotherhood, a love for each other, a love for this music. Um, we both grew up uh, very modestly. Our folks worked hard to have what little they had, but they were God-fearing people, uh, both sets of parents. Uh, we love white cornbread and pinto beans just plain old ordinary folks. That's what we grew up as, grew up around. Uh, so we connected immediately. And our love for music, uh, for particular kinds of music, for particular groups, to be honest with you, uh, we had a lot of parallels. And um, so I told him, I said, uh, I called that day. I said, you sitting down? He said, yeah, why? His label after he went solo, his label had been kind of teasing him with the idea of because it's Southern gospel music, you really ought to have some kind of group. Um, soloists are fine, but at that point he's, you know, he's, he's having to stand up against Lauren L and Sandy and, you know, people like that. So, um, him being out here for just a couple of years, I guess the record company thought that that might be a little, be a little of a challenge, but I mean, he's gained in popularity quite quickly. But as Gerald would tell you, uh, he don't like being alone. Uh, Donna went with him in those days, uh, I think primarily so he wouldn't be alone. So the day I called him, I said, are you sitting down? He said, um, yeah, why? I said, well, I just want to call you and let you know you need to start praying about this. He said, praying about what? I said, I'm going to move to Marstown and uh, we're going to start a group. <laughs> and the phone got quiet for a minute. He said, say that one more time. I said, just pray about it. I'm serious. Just pray about it. For some reason, this won't leave me alone. And uh, I think this is what, something we're supposed to do. And this was like the week after quartet convention that year and in december of 90 is when i moved to marstown and we started greater vision and uh i'll never forget chris allman was he was the first and the 13th person to try out first. to try that first and the 13th uh the day that we had tryouts after we announced that we were going to do it, we had the tryouts and, and here we are all of these years later, <laughs> all of the changes that have been made and what's going on in our group and greater vision is enjoying, uh, they're walking right up to the 30th anniversary this year. And, uh, Chris Alman is singing tenor and that group and doing a remarkable job. Yeah. And then uh, after your time with Greater Vision was, was over, you had, a, you had the opportunity to work with uh, another great quartet as they were undergoing some rebuilding, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you and uh, Jay Parrick and eventually Jonathan Wilburn helped create a, a new sound, if you will, for Gold City. and. Uh, it was during that time you, you really got to be involved more uh, in something that you truly love and that's producing and arranging. Yeah. And you, you spent some wonderful times behind the control boards during your Gold City years. I did. And if it hadn't been for Glenn and George, I would never have done that. When we did the live, uh, the live at the traveling live album, that project in Winston Salem, North Carolina. Um, that was my introduction uh, to being hands-on in studio work and in post-production and all those things. And it literally um, was Glenn and George on the way home one night from the weekend on a Sunday night, uh, uh, Larry Goss had told them that he was gonna be 
mixing the next day and starting to mix the next day. And for two, three days in a row there, he'd be mixing this live project, however long it took. And uh, it, I guess Glenn and George, it wasn't that Glenn and George had a trust issue with Larry. There was just a lot of integral parts in some of those old songs that we revisited uh, on that project. And uh, George said, now, Larry is a musician first and a singer second. So I would feel better if one of us was there to kind of help guide him through the vocal mix part of this process. And uh, Glenn said, he just literally turned around in the seat in front of that bus and looked at me and said, uh, Mark, if we bought you a plane ticket, would you be willing to go down there and spend the day tomorrow and Tuesday? Well, yes, sir. As far as I know, I can. I don't, I don't see any reason I can't. That's what started it. And uh, I spent two days with Larry and that's back in the two inch tape days. And uh, about a third of that project wound up on the cutting floor in the editing process. But at the end of all of it, boy, it was good. And I had a blast and I, I got a taste of being able to be around that and to enjoy the creative side of what we do. And uh, so much, I guess they figured out I was a little bit particular uh, about parts and uh, about harmony structure and singing on pitch the best we can, things like that. So uh, Larry and I were a good match. I loved Larry Goss, loved him, miss him every day. But that was my introduction to all of that that would follow suit in later years. And when I got to Gold City, uh, I was able to enjoy uh, working in the publishing area for the Gold City Publishing Companies and also uh, able to enjoy uh, helping to pick the songs uh, for the projects, uh, helping to do the arrangement on them. Uh, Steve Marlin and myself uh, made a really good team during the Gold City days. A lot of great songs. But man, listen, when you got Kyle Rowland uh, and Diane Wilkinson and uh, the list can go on, Squire, uh, all of those people, uh, that, that great nucleus of writers that we had during those days, Sandy Knight, uh, and I could just keep on calling names, but my goodness, you can't go wrong when you have those folks, uh, anointed writers uh, that are calling saying, okay, when are you going to record next? And they were helping us in the rebuilding process. They knew uh, what we had a desire to do and they wanted to help us in uh, restructuring Gold City. And man, I'm telling you, it was a labor of love. I spent almost nine years with them and uh, we fell in love with Gadsden. And when we left Gold City, as the industry says, if there ain't nobody mad at you, you can stay in the same town if you want to. <laughs> so that's what we did. And as you know, we've been here now for, uh, my goodness, since uh, January of 1994. And I've had to shovel very little snow. Uh, almost none. Exactly. Yeah. I can tell you the three times it has snowed since we've been here. <laughs> Jacksonville, Florida, uh, Westside Baptist Church. Um, I forget the month because we're both over 50 now and sometimes the details get fuzzy. Yeah. We were at an event. Gold City was on the program. Uh, Tony Gore and Majesty, I think maybe the Kingsman and maybe one other group. You came over to me while one of the other groups was on stage and said, uh, I think I'm going to do something and I don't know how this is going to turn out. And that was the first inkling that uh, a Mark Trammell group was in the making. Now you had, you'd already shared a little bit with, uh, uh, with Tim and some of the others, but uh, you came over that night and said, uh, this is what I think is going to happen. And I am relatively scared out of my mind but I'm going to do it, I think. And uh, 
since that time, it's it's been full speed ahead. I do remember one other statement you made that night, and uh, this has always stuck with me. He said, "I've got to start as a trio. Number one, you know, financially, it's it's a, a little better to do that." He said, "More importantly, I've stood next to George Johnson, Tim Riley. Whatever bass singer would come in right now, I would be murder on." Uh, and it, I would have been unfair to them. I, yeah. I honestly think that. Yeah. I mean, you and think it, about you the bass singers I've been around in my career, and hey, <laughs> I, I I don't think I would have been fair. Yeah. And, and, and it took you a while to get past that point. I mean, yeah. uh, it did. And, uh, you know, and since that time, the, the bass singers that have been part of a group, um, you know, you. Uh, they've, they've made the comments that Mark has told us many times we've, he had to ease into the idea of having a quartet. But now that you're there, you've got a great blend and, uh, of, of people in terms of personalities and talents. You know, from, there's not a weak spot from, from the tenor down to the pianist. I'm blessed by these guys. I truly am. I, I'm I'm as happy with this bunch as any group I've ever been in. This particular group, um, they love each other. They fight like brothers, but they love like brothers. Um, and you talking about bass singers. Um, if I'm real honest, the two bass singers that we've had, there's not a whole brain between the two of them. You couldn't get a whole brain out of them. Uh, but they are the most fun people you've ever been around. Uh, Randy, I'm telling you, Randy, had, he came here and he just kind of locked into place and people love him. They love his personality. They love the fact that, uh, if they run out of something to say, he can help them. He's a really good talker. So if he finds a good listener, they become friends quickly. Um, uh, but Randy also, uh, he, he likes to make people think he's got kind of a rough exterior. But he's a big old baby. That's all he is. He loves people. He loves to see good things happen to people. Um, uh, he just fits. The first time I heard him take a lead on a song and sing it like a lead singer in a bass register, and I heard the familiarity of that voice, uh, I could tell that he grew up loving George like I did before he ever told me he did. Uh, it wasn't that he wanted to be George, but he took on some of that personality uh, in his singing and the heart in his singing. Uh, Randy will tell you, he's not the lowest bass singer in our industry, but that's all well and good. I don't need the lowest bass singer in our industry. I don't have anything to prove. I've been out here 46 years. I'd rather have somebody that can sing with us instead of on us. That's the difference for me personally. That's the way I feel about it. There's not going to be a better low bass singer than Tim Riley. There's just not one. That's just my opinion. Others may differ and that's fine. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. But when it comes to bass singing that fits what we do and the kind of music I like to sing, Randy does a great job. Nick, uh, it's strange how Nick came to us. Uh, I really, uh, you secretly know that I didn't want him on my bus. I didn't want him to do what I do. Not that I thought there was anything wrong with it. I just didn't want, that's my boy. I didn't want him to go through the burdens uh, of, of all that has had to transpire in order for us to keep doing what we do without it being his own burden to do it. And God proved to us in a very real way that he was supposed to be here. And he's been here now for eight years and just continues to grow as a singer. People love him. Uh, he's not flamboyant. He's not flashy. He's just there. He's just solid, continues to grow, continues to mature as a singer, continues to mature as a songwriter. Uh, some of our industry people, uh, our industry heroes are investing in him from a songwriting standpoint. And, uh, boy, I, I'm so proud of him. I truly am. Stephen Adair, uh, is the newest member. Uh, he's our tenor. 
I didn't see that one coming, Danny. I'm honest with you. I, I didn't see that one coming. I anticipated uh, being able to, to talk to s some tenors that I knew were out there, uh, some that were between jobs, uh, some that had jobs. Uh, but I, they knew that I wasn't going to call them. They had to call me. And when we put the announcement out, one of the first people that sent an email was Stephen. And uh, in his email, he shared with me, I, I'm not displeased with where I am, but I've watched you for years and I would love the opportunity to sing with you guys if you would allow me to try out. And I'm going to reveal something right now that folks don't know, uh, but I, it's been long enough now that I don't mind telling it. Uh, because of the fact that he was with actively with another group at that time, and a group that I grew up admiring and still admire to this day. Uh, I, I waited till last to even let him come and try out. But when he got here and he stood in the living room of this house and sang with us, the first song, um, Randy and Nick both looked straight at me. Look, I mean, stared a hole through me midway through the first song. It's like, okay, you've been waiting for the answer. If you can't hear this one, we need to turn your spiritual hearing aid up because this is the guy. And it's like, we all knew immediately that, that he was the one and he has come in here and just stolen the hearts of people. And uh, he has a real knack for singing the old songs with a heart from the old school. And uh, you know that I love that. Uh, all the great orchestration, uh, all the hoopla, all the barn burner songs, they're great in their place. And I love doing them as much as anybody. But when that man is given the intro and he starts singing walk with me, it will stop things in their place. And there's just an anointing on him when he sings it and he conveys that story. Let me follow in thy footsteps that trod the shores of Galilee in a pure voice. The only thing I don't like about him is he looks so much like your twin brother. Yeah, I know. We've had <laughs> conversation. And, uh, but before we get to that story, by the Wait, way, I've got one more. No, no, no. I'm, we're we're going to talk about Trevor. That's, that's what okay. I would say. Okay. Trevor is the, uh, the, the uh, I don't know how to describe Trevor. Uh, he is the comic relief, if you will, of, of the Mark Trammell bus. Mm -hmm. uh, n number one is because all of you pick on him uh, without, uh, without ceasing. Yeah, we have a new toy. Right. And, but he brings it on itself. Yeah, he does. He does. But, yeah, he's like, he's like Ken Payne used to be when Ken would get on the cathedral bus, Glenn's brother and uh, antagonize every one of us. And then we'd give it back to him. Then he'd whine about it. Well, Trevor's like the same way. <laughs> However, when uh, you made the decision that it was time to put a live pianist on the bus, get away from uh, just the four vocals and tracks, but put a pianist on the bus. Um, it didn't take long before you realized, okay, this could be a good match. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's delivered. He, he has. He has. He's uh, 22 now, I believe. Seems like he had a birthday while we've been off. Uh, 22 years old, going on 70. Yeah. He's, but that's okay. Uh, he's a mammal. Dear Lord, he's a mammal. And takes longer to get ready than any of the rest of us do. I mean, literally, it'll take him 30 minutes to get ready and the rest of us, you know, 10 minutes, we can be headed out the door. Uh, but he's a mammal. He's got to have every hair in place and he's got to make sure he has shaved all three of the hairs that's on his face. Uh, it's just, it's funny. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious to watch him get ready to go in. And when he starts playing the piano, I figured out the first weekend he was with us, if you nailed the boy's left foot to the floor, he couldn't play the piano. He just couldn't play. 
But as we said, he's delivering and uh, he just completes the package of today's Mark Trammell Quartet. Oh, really well. People love him everywhere we go. They fall in love with him. Well, before we go, I've got to touch on something here that some people will know, especially those on the industry inside. But a lot of fans do not know that today I am visiting with Southern Gospel Music's most creative, most infuriating, most devious practical joker that has ever walked in Southern Gospel Music. Hmm. The list of victims hmm. of the jokes of Mark Trammell is endless. I've had several. Hmm. Michael Booth has had several. Everybody that you have sang with yeah. has had cerebral. And we won't even talk about Susan Wisnett, who has endured in t uh, just tons of stuff it's 12 that you've come up with. Uh, yeah. However, I'll give everybody a, a, a little personal story here. When okay. Stephen Adair joined Mark Trammell Quartet, the first comment out of Mark's mouth to me was, well, I hired your twin brother. Yes. Uh, and you've not let that go since. Uh, in fact, at the, the 2019 National Quartet Convention, the brand new group photo had come out. And every time you walked by the singing news booth, you would make a comment, something about the photo, or Stephen, or Stephen, we're having a group meeting, make sure you're there, all that stuff. So by the end of the National Quartet Convention, I was signing Mark Trammell Quartet pictures for Stephen. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not going to say that you did that on purpose, but I would find it very hard to believe that that was accidental. I'll plead the fifth. Mm -hmm. Yes, you will. All right. Anyway, our guest today has been Mark Trammell, uh, one of the true legends of Southern gospel music. And I say that in complete sincerity. He's also been a great friend of mine for a long, long time. And Mark, thank you uh, for giving that part of your day to be with us today. And uh, all we can say is we hope you have another great four decades of singing gospel music. Thank you, buddy. A joy to be with you.